I bet you never thought you were going to hear about food physics twice today. <laughs> <clears throat> My name is Bill Yassis, and I am a pastry chef. He said in a confessional tone. <laughs> so what is a pastry chef doing at a talk about healthy food? Um, <clears throat> Well, it's kind of like uh, we were saying earlier that um, when a member of one political party advocates something from the other political party, then people really listen. Oh, he said that? Richard Nixon did the EPA? So people, I think that's why I was invited. So as a pastry chef, I can talk to you about, um, about healthy living. And if pastry chefs are worried that the amount of fat and sugar that we're consuming <laughs> is a problem, then we really have a problem. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't want to totally disavow my profession. I think it's important to keep the notion of pleasure alive, and a delicious dessert is a potent symbol of that. One of the things that scares people in the, is the thought that healthy food is the opposite of pleasure, deliciousness, flavor. So by keeping a small, well-made dessert with good ingredients made from uh, purveyors who have integrity, keeping that on the menu, we can keep our hedonistic pleasures intact but we also keep them in check. So what I'm advocating today is a hedonistic culture of healthy eating. So we let the, our evolutionary impulses that drive our desires have some outlet, just not run wild on our health. So there's the aforementioned. Um, I work at the White House, as you heard, so uh, bipartisan and, and patriotic I am. Um, but as a chef, uh, there are many things that I think we can do, myself and other chefs, to change the way we eat and to improve the way we eat. So we have beautiful cakes, amazing creations. So there is that, that urge towards hedonistic pleasure. We do want to keep that in, as part of the formula, but we know that too much of it causes cell damage, and we're learning more and more about how this is contributing to obesity and diabetes. But as chefs, just like Al Hurt, jazz music, we take the traditions that have come down to us and we recreate them as Americans. Just like jazz recreates those, those European traditions, we as chefs, American chefs, want to recreate the flavors. And um, that is something that a lot, of, um, a lot of chefs are doing today. So there's many delicious things in the world. But we're thinking about how to change the ingredients, how to change what we put in those cakes so that we're not hurting ourselves. So honey is one of the really great uh, replacements for refined sugar. It's flavorful. It has uh, less fructose. And you need less of it. It also, secret from the pastry chef, keeps your cakes moist longer. Um, here is, a, here is a picture of uh, Charlie Brantz, the man who started the beekeeping program at the White House. It's still going now. Um, he's harvesting some of the honey with a delicious uh, comb and uh, fresh honey, which was uh, harvested from the south lawn of the White House. So um, how do we change those flavors? Because we have uh, a lot of flavors, uh, very much a cultural uh, sort of concept. We learn it from our very early years. But it's recently been proved how early we learn our flavors, or we, we sort of develop flavors. Um, Gary Beauchamp at the Monell Chemical Senses uh, Center in Philadelphia has learned that uh, we uh, develop tastes for these kind of vegetables at a very early age, even in the prenatal uh, period. So in the third trimester of pregnancy, flavors he has shown in his studies are transmitted through the amniotic fluid. What happens is that infants in the third trimester are tasting. And they, so it's not just apocryphal that we say, oh, well, Susie likes carrots because mom ate carrots when she was pregnant. That's really true. And the reason he found this out was he did a study uh, with a very bitter medicine that uh, was developed to help children who could not process protein um, to do so. And so he was, uh, he, this, uh, this medicine was developed, but kids wouldn't eat it. So he started uh, feeding uh, the mothers, the pregnant mothers, this medicine. And it turns out that the children would accept it. The, the children, after they were born, would accept and be happy um, as this baby is. So. We all love pictures of happy babies and these things. <clears throat> so how do we change those, uh, those ideas and those flavors? 
that we grew up with. And there's a lot of people who have shown us the way. Uh, one of my favorites is called Spoons Across America. It was founded by Julie Jordan. It's an excellent uh, resource for chefs such as myself who go into schools and talk to kids about healthy eating. They have a program called Days of Taste in which chefs go to the schools and they present a vegetable as a subject of study. So we don't go in and say, oh, you should eat vegetables. We go in and we talk about cauliflower. Well, cauliflower, did you know it's a flower? Here's the root system. Here's how it grows. Here's the microbiology of the soil. So you engage the children's natural curiosity, and you get them excited about just learning. And then eventually, they're like, well, can I eat it? <laughs> no, not yet. So we let them get excited about it. There's other people. Uh, around the country who are doing the same kind of things. Mike Curtin at DC Central Kitchen in Washington, DC, where I'm from, has a fantastic program for uh, disadvantaged youth uh, to come in and learn how to cook. As Mike says, we are never going to feed our way out of hunger. Hunger is part of a larger picture of recidivism, neglect, lack of education. But teaching people how to cook, teaching people how to relate to food is a much more effective way to change the way that they think about food and want to eat. Um, we have the wonderful and amazing, who you uh, just, that's, this is uh, Michael Curtin's uh, group. OK. And then, of course, uh, Green Bronx Machine, building these walls of, of uh, vegetables. Steve, who got us started and got really everyone excited about how to engage young people in this dialogue. And they, once they are bitten by the bug, they really get into it. Dan Barber. I had a picture of Dan, but I think this represents Dan much better. <laughs> Dan is one of those chefs who has an incredible ability to use local, sustainable, organic produce and to make it the best tasting food in the world. To me, this is one of the beautiful plates that I've seen and I've been cooking for 30 years. Uh, and it's delicious. It sort of reminds me of the Michel Brasse uh, plate, which uh, came out so many uh, years ago called Gagu Yu, and it was 26 vegetables, each cooked independently, so they were at their perfect crispness or perfect cooking uh, temperature, and put together on a plate. To me, this is the Gagu Yu of, the, of 2013. Um, if you want to know how good legumes can taste, Cesare Casella, who's here today, I mean, this guy takes Tuscan beans, their voluptuous, lavish, beautiful, sexy, silky beans, and and yet it's part of my plate. It's one quarter of my plate, legumes, what we're supposed to be eating to keep ourselves healthy. Uh, Michel Nichon, um, I think we have him in here somewhere. Uh, thank you, Michel, for the great introduction. He's the person who really got me knowing about this program. I, as I told you earlier, I, I'm a converted, you know, a repentant pastry chef. I still do like the desserts, but Michel told me how much Organic food can have flavor. And what I really hate about Michel is that not only does he go out and do all this stuff for Wholesome Wave and Snap and doubling food stamps, but the food at his restaurant is fantastic. I don't know how you do that. Are, are you truly flawless? <laughs> we'll ask Laurie later. So I hope I haven't missed anybody. Um, to me, this is the next phase of where our awareness has to go. Um, and that is that national leaders have begun to talk about this. I'm a very proud member of Mrs. Obama's team in Let's Move. And our national leaders, also even in England, oh, this is David Cameron, um, uh, Prince Charles has an organic farm and speaks eloquently on the need to change the way we grow and food and the way we eat it. So our national leaders have now recognized this, and it's very powerful. I can tell you that. Um, it has been uh, such a great honor to work there and have see the growth of this uh, program. Sam Cass, who is the domestic policy advisor of the White House, started this garden. If you know anything about Washington, DC, to get anything done anywhere is difficult. To do it on the White House lawn is an enormous, it's a gargantuan task. He got this uh, garden started there with Mrs. Obama. And now we have kids coming from all over Washington, DC to help us plant and harvest. And this is uh, an amazing way to get them engaged. It's they, we don't have to explain anything. When they plant the food and they come back later and we have a picnic with them, they love eating it. So we have kids to visit the garden twice a week. We bring kids from the local schools down to see the garden and to learn about healthy eating. Um, sometimes older people visit. There's one right there. Um, 
insects visit. We have a beautiful uh, spring day. Here's something interesting, French artichokes, which we plant every year. The seeds were given to us from Thomas Jefferson. Do you believe that? You're gullible, but it's true. <laughs> Peter Hatch, who is the gardener at Monticello, has developed these, hy these not, hy not hybrid, they're really um, heirloom seeds that have been passed down from Jefferson. Jefferson was uh, president for eight years, but he was a gardener for the rest of his life into his 80s. So what I love to talk about with the kids is that really agriculture, healthy eating, and delicious food is part of our DNA as Americans. It is where we come from. All of our founding fathers were very interested in farming, very interested in food. John Adams had a small garden in, in uh, Massachusetts. Thomas Jefferson, as I just said, spent the rest of his life gardening. He said, I'm an old man, but a young gardener. Um, George Washington, of course, yes, he believed in democracy. He believed in the uh, Declaration of Independence. But he also believed in not being overtaxed for the food that he was growing on his farm, which is one of the real reasons that he started the Re American Revolution. So and a great book I want to recommend to you called Founding Farmers. It goes through that whole period of 1776 into 1786 when the Constitution was written. Uh, and those three men were uh, very much influential in, in talking about agriculture in America and, and how important it is to the way we live now. So it, it's not something new. It's something that we lost. We're, it's very much part of our country until uh, the middle of the last century. And then we started to want to be efficient and, and find um, convenient foods and, and efficient ways of cooking. Uh, every year, as I say, we have the spring planting and a fall harvest. Kids come from around D.C. And, uh, and help us to do that. It's an amazing program and one that I hope has inspired people around. Here's the picnic that the kids have uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the harvest. We have chefs come from around the country to come and cook uh, at that harvest. We do it right next to the garden. So they really see the food is in the ground, the food is on your plate, and it's delicious. Mrs. Obama has been tireless in not only the healthy eating, but the exercise. So this is not photoshopped. Every time I show this to somebody, they say, what is that? So Mrs. Obama had this guy come, this balloon that blows up, and that's taken in what's called the diplomatic reception room. It's a, one of the private rooms. The uh, wallpaper was put there by uh, Mrs. Kennedy, Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy, in the renovation in the 60s. And uh, so she has people come, interact with kids. So what kid is not going to want to join this guy in jumping across the diplomatic reception room? She also has had chefs come. Chef's Move has come, into the, uh, has come onto the South Lawn. These, all, everybody there signed up to uh, sign up and go into schools and teach kids about uh, healthy eating, Jimmy Fallon. And what our next step is, we want to use science, science-based learning, to talk about, teach kids about food and to use food to teach about science. This is something we do. This is from a course at Harvard that we do in the um, School of Engineering and Applied Scientists. It's the physics department. So we talk to uh, the students there about elasticity with the pizza dough. We talk to kids about how vegetables are grown and processed, and it always helps to have this is where cartoon characters can be useful. If they're going to be you know, used to sell Oreos, let's use them to, to teach kids about healthy food. They get very excited. We do science. We do math. All of it related to food and recipes. Uh, we, do some, we do molecular gastronomy. We teach them about um, liquid nitrogen and how you can make a quick ice cream. We use all the magic and all the wonderful things about cooking that are at our disposal to get them excited. Here is a, the professors at Harvard uh, doing what's called super cooling. So what they do is they take water. It's actually, it was actually a sauce, eucalyptus sauce. Freeze it to a very low temperature. You probably have heard of superheating. That's when you put your coffee in the microwave and you heat it too much. And then when you jiggle the pot, it, the, the, the cup rather, it overflows because that's when it boils. Well, the molecules have not been activated enough to actually boil, but it is over 212 Fahrenheit. Likewise, with cooling, you cool the water or the sauce to a very, very low temperature below freezing, but you don't agitate it. So then when you pour it out, it freezes on the plate. So this was used by Juan Roca to serve a eucalyptus sauce in his restaurant. And Michael Brenner there and Jose Andreas are showing the students how it's done. So we do everything we can to engage them, to, to get kids excited about learning and about whether it's science teaching food or food teaching science. Uh, we love doing it, and we're going to continue it. Thank you so much. Thank you.